as you know me, right? This is my spot, right? Let it come up and fail. Let all the chasers kind of forget about it. And then when it quiets down, you get this nice little base. Like the majority owner, like SoftBank, that the Japanese fund owns 90% of the, no, owns 90% of ARM. And I think that's just a major, that's something major to really consider because they're, you know, they're a long-term investor. And I was like, so, so happy about it. I was like, oh, that was a good setup. You know, life is good. Made, made my back, two hour trade. Made back my losses. Yeah, yeah. Made back. I'm break even on the name or just a bit in profit. And next thing you know, uh, you know, if we bring back the chart a bit forward, you know, I settled for two R when the trade technically was like, I don't know what the range I took was probably a 10 R trade. Just because time's going by and we're not proven right, it still hasn't proven us wrong. And, and that's, you know, for me, that's the lesson and the takeaway for, for how I traded this. Welcome to episode eight of the Axis Investor Show. In today's episode, we're going to be breaking down SOUN, arm liquidation play, and a few other topics that are really important to listen if you want to improve your trading. So as usual, all the best tools will be linked in the description. So if you're looking for a broker, scanner, charts, or newsfeed, don't forget to check that out. And also, we are available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify if you want to listen to the audio version of this show. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right. Welcome to our weekly weekly show where we catch up with each other. Alex, how's it going? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? <laughs> uh, I'm hanging in there. I, uh, you know, just taking it one day at a time. Um, for me, it's been a little bit slow. I've had a, a tough go at, at trying to catch... Um, you know, really make to, uh, progress for, for March. But, uh, you know, how about yourself? Oh, hopefully you're doing a little better than I am. Uh, the month started with a lot of FOMO and then it, it started to kind of catch up in terms of opportunity. And it's some type of trade um, that I don't like to do as much anymore, but the opportunity are just there. So I feel like I, I have to break that rule. And it, uh, the, tr the main trade is going to be on SOUN, and there was also this ARM trade that I thought were good opportunities, some stuff I try to avoid, but at the same time, kind of maybe mixing, um, like knowing when to break a rule and versus just not taking advantage of the opportunity at all. So, I mean, it's, it's decent this month compared to last month for me. Uh, a bit more progress in terms of PNL. And I think the biggest progress have been just um, that I'm back at the gym. So I'm working out a bit more. And I just feel that was just a big part of it, trying to get out of the house and not just stay in front of my screen. And so for on that hand, it's it's been pretty good. Good. That's good to hear. Yeah. Like every every style is cyclical, you know, and it's important it's important to recognize that and know when to maybe make changes. If, if that's within your, you know, your rule set and, and when to kind of dial it back, like for myself, my trades just aren't there. So I'm dialing it back a little bit. Yeah, that was my main thing. I was trying to play, I guess, a bit more your style because I know it, it works <laughs> and I know uh, your type of trades. And I was settling for like subpar opportunity thinking that, oh, maybe this is the next home run, which I somewhat gave up uh, this week. So it's been a bit, uh, a bit better in terms of, uh, of uh, just losing money on random setup and making uh, more money on the one that I know are going to really play out. Yeah. And that's exactly, that's the adapt, you know, that's you adapting as a trader and that's exactly what you should be doing. Yeah. I, th I think it, in terms of that sense, it's good. It's always unfortunate that it doesn't um, pay off as much quickly as we would have liked or we would like, but you know, it is what it is. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. And I think it's going to bring to um, the second section that I wanted to cover, which was the CPI and also there was the PPI today. The CPI has been a pretty good trade, I guess, the last two years. It's been slowing down. It's becoming a bit less important. Um, is there a way that you see this type of opportunity or you look at these numbers when they come out? Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't I don't know. Like, I, I just, I resign to the fact that I, I don't know, like, I don't know what the big players are really thinking, what numbers they're expecting. Um, you can see the estimates, uh, you know what the trends are, but in the end, I think the, the bigger picture thesis is that as long as these numbers are still coming in a little bit hot, um, 
that the chances for a rate cut sooner kind of diminish. Um, you know, even though, you know, we keep hearing all the data from Powell and, and you see the economic data, it's just we're at an uncertain moment. And in my opinion, and I think that's kind of where, why we're kind of stalling. Um, but to that, you know, even though the data is coming in hot and the number's a little higher, the market is, for the most part, holding up pretty well. We're not falling apart, um, even though I think after today's PPI number, I saw that the chances for a June rate cut decreased even further. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't have any expectations. Um, I like to just plan and then react accordingly um, based on what I see. And the market's still choppy. So, and you know, I'm not seeing much follow through in the names that I'm looking for. So for me, it still just means, you know, um, lighten up a little bit and just either slow down or just trade a little bit smaller. Sorry for the interruption, but if you have any question or topic that you'd like us to cover, let us know in the comment section. And while you're at it, like and subscribe. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense because the last time we saw like a big uh, shift in momentum and things really break out was the beginning of this AI cycle. And it all started with SMCI. As I remember, it could have been a bit before. And uh, we talked about that. That was probably end of January. Now we are actually March, mid-March. So in terms of like hype cycle, I feel like it has maybe done its time. I mean, it doesn't mean it's not going to go up, but like the real easy money in that sector. For me, I think it was really like the start of the move. I feel it's going to be easy to just uh, turn some shares uh, like, you know, going forward and always just trying to play the next big breakout in these names. I don't know if you have you have more experience with cycle and really trading um, hype sector. Have you have have you have any thoughts on that, or do you think about it in a certain way? Yeah, I, I mean, I just I totally agree with what you just said. Uh, you know, every every cycle, I'd say that cycles for me. You know, I, I can't put an exact time frame on it. I would say like the four to seven week range is is a good time frame. You know, like a month, month and a half really of trading. Um, you know, this is where you have to, you know, so many people, day traders, especially are just focused on the, the one minute chart. And then they're looking at the daily just for like their, their short term levels. But from a bigger picture perspective, the spy and maybe the Q were, were both up 17 of the last 19 weeks or 16 of the last 18 weeks, something crazy. And, you know, SMCI, I think has been green every single week of 2024 right so you just you need a pause right nothing goes up and down you know it just continuously right um so even though there was that blow off top trade that we talked about on a daily chart from a weekly perspective yeah it's extended but it could come off say 300 dollars on a weekly chart and still be within the top 30 percent of its range and still look really good technically from a longer term hedge fund investor status uh, standpoint. Mm, that, that's really interesting. I, I probably don't think about about these trades like that deeply, except for that two minute chart. I don't go to the one minute, but the two minutes. And I mean, I haven't haven't thought about it really in terms of stats and maybe it's something I should look more. Um, Sometimes I'm always between adding more data or more information to my trading as keeping sometimes some of it out um, just to avoid having conflicting opinion and already go with what I'm used to. All right. So the, the next thing I think would be important to cover was the best opportunity of the week. And this one was S-O-U-N. I, th I thought it was personally the best opportunity of the week. Um, I want to know your thoughts about it. Do you think it was that good? Because we did talk a bit about it yesterday. And what you told me, told me, it was, it's a very choppy, uh, it was a very choppy setup. Even if it ended up working out, I got stopped out uh, multiple, ch multiple um, times on the name. It just, it was hard, but the opportunity was there. I think I did a mistake and it was about taking it as like a really a day trade versus maybe more of a swing opportunity. And I wanted to go over the chart. This was, this was the setup we're, we're talking about right here. You know, let's take these last couple of days out, right? So 
technically nice bold flag, strong move. Um, and then you get this nice top up here. You get a consult pull back into this, you know, little bread basket of moving averages and it starts to move higher. It gets tight again now with this, you know, for me, my nine EMA on the daily chart really offering support. Um, you know, looking at from a daily perspective, you know, <clears throat> just a basic candlestick type entry. If you're a swing trader, you know, you're looking at 630 by, by 560, um, you know, a 70 cent risk. And, you know, your first target always, ha always has to be up towards this eight, this eight area. Um, so say like a dollar, dollar 70 worth of risk. So, you know, that's your two hour trade. And then you can, you know, you look for more um, as long as it continues, right? And, you know, as, as, as we talked about, it was just, it was super choppy. Um, here's that 623 level, right? And it, it was just super, super choppy. Oops. Um, and I, and I just couldn't time it. And I just had too much of a day trader mentality with it. And I should have had a swing trader mentality because it was more of a swing trade setup. And, but I was just really trying to, I was trying to maximize the gains, right? Trying to leverage up and really try to catch it both on a swing and a day trade time frame, and where I could um, kind of um, pay for the trade, pay for the swing trade risk um, with like catching this like day trade move. Um, and I just kind of fumbled it, right? We talked about it here um, and then it pulled back. I just, I lost track of it. And when it broke out here the second time, and this is, this was my, this is like, you know, as you know, me, right. This is my spot, right. Let it come up and fail. Let all the chasers kind of forget about it. And then when it quiets down, you get this nice little base and, you know, then you can risk that 640 by like say 620 ish, right. Your 30 cent risk um, to really catch the move. And, and this is just the trending move that I like to see. Um, yeah. So uh, just to give a bit more, I guess, context is I saw this set up. And I sent you a message and say, hey, look, look at this chart. Seems like really good, very strong. And I, when I sent you the message, it was exactly in the, in the um, chaser's range. So that means when it, it broke back on, when it broke above this previous high on this like super wide uh, candle that you, you have on screen there. And then you, you know, you were like, ah, oh, not sure yet. And then I stopped out of that trade because I chased it at like a bad price. And next thing you know, it came back and I still had it on watch and I did take the trade when we broke back above high a day and yeah, just a bit further. So yeah, around there. And I risk exactly um, this tight range because I was like, oh, this is perfect. And then I, I sold it for, it must have been, I don't know, 30, 40 cents of profit. And I was like, all right, I'll look maybe to get back in like ex exactly that first red candle that you see there. That was my trade. That was probably a two hour trade, something like that. And I was like, so, so happy about it. I was like, oh, that was a good setup. You know, life is good. Made, made my back, two hour trade. Made back my losses. Yeah, yeah. Made back. I'm break even on the name or just a bit in profit. And next thing you know, uh, you know, if we bring back the chart a bit forward, you know, I settled for two hour when the trade technically was like, I don't know what the range I took was probably a, a 10 hour trade, something like that. It was like a home run. It was like an easy trade. It never broke out of the trend. It just kept on moving higher. But there's something about speed in a trade. When you're used to trading really short time frame, like I need something to really get away from price like very quick. Otherwise, I'm extremely uncomfortable in a trade, especially on the long side. They take a bit more time to play out versus the short. And this was was one of the example that it was a swing trade that I was trying to day trade and I just had mixed emotion and I, I just fumbled it. And um, yeah, so that was a bit, a bit of a miss, not a bit, a pretty good miss. I mean, looking at this chart, is there a different way that you would have played it or <clears throat> hindsight for sure, but still? Um, I mean, yeah, it just, look at just even, even for me on a, on a, on a swing trade, right. And in, in my swing trades, I prefer to look at, you know, 15, 30 or 60 or whatever. Um, that, that breakout day, it, it you know, like you said, it, yeah, it, it, it's like a grinder stock, right? It's just grinding higher. 
you know, up, down, look at this wick that comes down to break even. Um, it, you know, it just did, it, it didn't make it easy on that first day one, right? You break out and you, and you push up that, you push up 30 cents and it comes, you know, it comes back in, but, you know, technically speaking, it's still good, right? Because it's just riding moving averages. It's above VWAP. It's, it's, you know, and I think you described it perfectly, like where you and, and I definitely just had um, like a mixed game plan mentally where, where we wanted to swing trade it or had the idea of us for a swing trade. And we also wanted to day trade it, but in terms of day, you know, depending on your day trading style, right. You know, looking for those quick momentum bursts and, and it just, it never really gave that, right. Like, you know, one, do, one, two candle up, two down, one candle up, three, four down, you know, two up, pause candle up, right. It just didn't really, you know, it, it didn't really get clean until here the next day where, right. Where, you know, you, you, you would ask me yesterday, it's like, oh, this was your perfect setup, right, right back to this. Um, you know, it was a little ascending for me. So I wasn't like a huge fan and, you know, and, I, and, stupidly, you know, I had recency bias, like, well, I should have been long from 650. How can I get a swing trade here at 780? You know, um, and, and that's just letting my emotions take over my, you know, decision making a proper process. Right. And, you know, as we can see, and as people probably know, like, it just, it, it doesn't matter that I missed this part of the move. Right? If, if you think the stock can go to 10, Right, 780 is still a great entry, right? If you still have two dollars of upside, um, you know, because I was kind of thinking eight, eight to ten um, on my original swing trade idea. Yeah, I think um, I think the the next entry, the the second day that you were were showing there, which would have been the 13th of March, I think it was an even better setup. Um, and we we spoke about this before is the higher it gets the higher um it can go in in some way and it's a stock that's highly shorted right um every short seller that likes to to short these big play it was looking at it and the more extended it gets the the trappier or, or the more crowded it gets on the short side and like you know there's there could be this like elastic uh, type of action when when everybody gets off or gets out of the trade, it really starts to go. And I, I've seen this setup many, many times, and it's always something I struggled um, taking these these trades just because there's there's slower trades. I don't know if you have any tips on it or it's really about, you know, just sitting down and not looking at the trade. Sometimes the best thing to do, which is odd, you know? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that's, for me, that that's, that I found that that's the best thing that I can do. Um, Every time that I have such strong emotions towards a trade like this one, and I sit and watch it, I always second guess myself, right? You know, once you, once you see that red candle start to form, it's like, oh, well, you know, this is a, this, this isn't really going to happen. What kind of stock is this? This isn't like a, an NVIDIA where there's clear, obvious momentum. This is like a slow moving stock with a lot of volume and a lot of size. It just doesn't move as, you know, freely as like something that has a smaller float even though you know these you know you would think that seeing you know what is this five seven eight million shares of volume on a on, on this on each 15 minute candle you you think you'd see some big wide green candles if something like this a big wide range green candle where you know you get a big solid 60 cent green candle and you know you just didn't see that in this in this particular name um, and th that's where, again, like psychology came into play where both of us are creating unnecessary fear just because time is going by, right? Um, just because time is going by and we're not proven right, it still hasn't proven us wrong. And, and that's, you know, for me, that's the lesson and the takeaway for, for how I traded this. How, how would you judge being wrong on that trade if we break below this i guess it's 730 level i can't see clearly because it's pretty small are you are you looking at uh, yesterday or two days ago uh, yesterday so in in, in this terms of this afternoon breakout is that what you're yeah, okay exactly well i mean just let's just leave it here because this is where you kind of you thought this is where you assumed that i was getting long right just because yeah. 
you saw this, you saw this little wick, you saw a pullback in, um, you know, for me, I'm, I'm all about the base. And, you know, even if it goes down to the 750s or 740s, it doesn't necessarily mean you're wrong, um, in my view, but it just means that it's either it needs more time or it's choppy because, you know, look at this, I call them railroad tracks. Look at the railroad tracks of these 15 minute moving averages. Um, you know, it, it, the nine minute EMA kind of supported it. This little basket supports it again, kind of like how it did on the daily, right? That 920 support basket. Um, price pushes higher, it starts to trade sideways. And then again, the nine just is kind of like riding and supporting it. Um, so I would have risked this trade at, I would have bought this trade, say, you know, even if I wanted to be cautious with it, say 785 by 750, so a 35 cent risk. That's how I would have thought, that's how I was thinking about it um, when I was watching it. And, you know, again, it's like, well, do I want to risk 35 cents? It's trading so thick, right? I want to be, I know that I can easily get 10, 20,000 shares in, in one penny. There's not, there's not gonna be a lot of slippage, you know, but if I want, do I want to risk 30 cents? Like, do I, and then again, it's the speed. Do I think a move to 10 is going to happen today? Do I think a 40 to 60 cent move is going to happen? So like 8, 30 to 8, 50 is going to happen. And, you know, I obviously just psyched myself out and, you know, we all know what happened. It, it made a, a very strong move into the end of, in, into the end of the day, you know, it made a dollar move, right? So a three to a three R trade on a day trade in the afternoon. Um, and, and this is what, this is, this is that nice trend. It's a nice trend. And then, and then everything starts to kind of turn and slope upwards. And that's the indication of, of the momentum, right? Um, you know, it kind of goes from a little flatter to a little more vertical, um, right? And that's how you kind of see these things play out. Um, so again, you know, I just let my biases uh, over over overrule my like the the process that I should have been following. Yeah. So sometimes you put yourself in the way of a good trade, and I think it's it happens often with trader that we think we know better than the stock or if for some reason versus putting yourself in the best spot and just accepting the risk. Exactly. And, you know, and, and, you know, look at both of us, we both admitted, like we thought we were smarter than the market and we wanted, we wanted it to prove us quickly. Right. We both, we, we both mentioned the word speed. We wanted it to prove us that we wanted to prove, we wanted to see that we were right immediately, very fast. Right. And that's, and that's always, that's not always the case. The market doesn't care about speed. It doesn't care about what our position is or what our emotions are. It's going to do things and, and move how it wants to, right? Based on all of the collective emotions and, and positions of all the players, right? Not just ours. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, that's well said. I don't think I would say it any other way. And I think it's, it brings also the next subject, which is the arm trade. So arm holding. This one is a liquidation trade. And the last time I think we had a liquidation play was VFS. And this was, um, I don't remember when, but it must have been at November or December, something like that. An insider lockout period is really when there's a new stock that gets issued and the insider not allowed to sell before sometimes 60 to 90 day or Sometimes even more, it's like 180 to like one year, Some, yeah, somewhere usually, around these it's, lines. It's usually 180 days. So 180 days. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, August, so August, six months from August, yeah, pro probably January. Maybe it was this day. Yeah. So it seems, it seems about right. Just a gap down and, and this trade wasn't like anything crazy and the last before this one, the last liquidation that I remember was having a lot of hype. It was the Tillery 2018, but that's that's just a long time ago. This was when the uh, the stock really went to 300 for the first time, and the CEO was like the richest, one of the richest men in the world, having like a company that had never made profit back then. It wasn't the first cannabis hype. Hype. This one was a big. It was a big trade. The reason why is the CEO came on CNBC or. Twitter, whatever platform it was back then. And he mentioned that he's like, even if the stock is up, I don't know how many percent, like 2000% at the, at that time it was, or a thousand percent, 
He's like, oh, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to sell any shares, even if it's lockout period, because I believe in my company. And on that particular day, the CEO just dumped everything he had, like, and this, the stock really, you know, really sold off um, drastically. And it was pretty much the end of that, that run. So that was like the, the idea, the idea that I was referring to in my head when I was looking at ARM, which was going to be a liquidation play because this is the, a really hyped sector and you know, it's, it's a legit company. It's really hyped up. Um, it's extended in like momentum or from its chart. So I thought they could be, um, they could be a good opportunity to really unwind maybe 30%, 20% if the major shareholder was just deciding that today I'm dumping. But he came out and said before that day that he wasn't going to sell or they weren't interested in liquidating their position. And I still went on in that trade um, thinking that like, I don't care really about the price action. If it's liquidation, I want to be involved. And it turned out to just be an absolute zero trade, like a total waste of mental capital. Um, so thin, so so thinly traded. I don't know if you have any more example or how would you consider this a good opportunity? And considering that it was it was talked about everywhere. <clears throat> yeah, I um, the the IPO the IPO lockup trade is just not it's not something that I'm not very good at trading it. I know that a lot of a lot of traders love trading it, especially on these uh, small cap ones that, that have big runs. Um, yes, and Tilray is a great example. Um, and I want to say that maybe like Nikola, Fisker, like some of these other small cap that they, when they had big runs after they IPO'd or spac or whatever they did, they it was always like a big, seemingly a big event on FinTwit and, you know, amongst like the prop circles. Um, and for me, I'm just, I don't, I'm not great at, I don't have a strong bias towards it. Right. And like, and as you're saying, you're, you had a strong bias towards shorting it. Um, and in this case, everyone, everyone on Twitter, I could see was talking about this, the lock update, how it's, you know, 95 million or 950 million, whatever it was, something crazy. Um, but I just don't think everyone everyone put the whole trade together, right? And and we kind of talked about that, right? Like everyone's if every, if everyone's talking about it, it's probably the opposite's probably going to happen, right? That's my and that's kind of how I think about things. It, like everyone is looking to short. If you look up, if you look, if you're an options trader, or you know, even if you're not, you should at least be aware of options flow. Everyone was buying puts into Monday. It, you know, it was, it was on the, you know, the lockup day was Monday, the 11th. Um, everyone was buying puts massive, massive put flow was going off. Um, you know, obviously as you can see, it's coming down, you know, 15, 20 bucks. Um, and right. If everyone's buying puts, what, what, what are the market, the market makers don't really want to get screwed. Right. You know what I mean? Like, so like it, how much is it, how far is it really going to go down? Right. Is it really going to go down? Like you said, 20, 30%, is it really going to go down towards a hundred? Um, you know, especially after making this massive move off of earnings, right? A hundred's down the, all the way down here. You know, is it, is it really going to break this entire range? Like maybe, maybe, you know, this is Monday and may, maybe you get a move down to one, one, you know, one fifteen ish. Right. So it would have been like $15 move, five, a 5% move. Um, I just think that everyone ha everyone had these crazy expectations, and and that's what kind of tempered it. Um, the other half of this trade is just a little bit different because you know, as you said, like the majority owner, like SoftBank, that the Japanese fund owns ninety percent of the no, owns ninety percent of ARM, and I think that's just a major that's something major to really consider because they're you know, they're long-term investors, like they're not, they're not, and they've, they've held arm forever and they finally IPO'd it. <clears throat> um, you know, people were interested in buying it for a long time. And, you know, as you said, they, they're not looking to sell it. Um, so if, if they're just, a til, just like Tilray, if they're not going to, if they're talking about how I'm not, not going to sell it and people are buying puts, right. That's, that isn't that like, those are two strikes against the short kind of the short play kind of working out. Yeah, I think um, if I would have seen like a crazy 
flow of volume coming in and like um, a really thick book, like you know, just constant selling like a, a low and then, you know, just staying really heavy. But we initially had this gap down. We had a flush on decent volume, which I think it was probably everyone just shorting it on this thing. Like if we, if we go, it's going to go right away and I don't want to miss it. A bit of a chase. Then we, we just were really whippy, as you like to say, it's the spread open up like crazy. It's an expensive stock. So, you know, sometimes you think you're risking like 40 cent and just there's a wick of 80 cents or something like that on it, which it, which makes it really hard to trade. It's like a 20, 30 cent spread. And it wasn't, it wasn't living to the hype. And do you think sometime uh, a bank like SoftBank is just going to sell a bit over time versus really dumping their holding? Or you think they, normally when it's a lockout and somebody wants out, they kind of jump, they, they dump every everything at once? I, I don't think they're going to dump everything at once. And I'm pretty, you know, I'm not an expert in, uh, I'm not an expert in filings. And, you know, so please take my response with a grain of salt, but I'm almost positive that they have to file when they're, when they're going to, when they are going to sell. Right. And that's what everyone was anticipating. Everyone was anticipating that they're going to file, they're going to sell, they're going to see the filings the next day, SoftBank sold. And, you know, the, the, the thesis would kind of play out over, over the course of a couple of days. Yeah. Cause I did have some alerts on filings, add alerts on the name, add alerts everywhere and nothing. <laughs> it was dead. Uh, so I, maybe I should have just wait for confirmation because if they have such a large holding, they can't sell it over one day. And if they want to dump it, I'm going to see it on the tape and very easily on the chart that like somebody's really selling here, which was just the opposite. And since then, uh, everybody went crickets that bought puts and nobody has opinion anymore. <laughs> exactly. Everyone lost and no one's ever going to show their losses and those tweets will all be you know silently deleted. So no one knows that they did that. Yeah. Um, when it comes to, um, is there a reason why you, you don't have that much of a bias on, on display? I I've seen, um, the more I talk to you, uh, the more I realize that when there's like a big company that has an offering, you're often saying like, no, this is not necessarily bad. It's probably good for them if they're able to raise that much cash and more often than not it end up being pretty right. For offering or liquidation play or whatever you want to call it, or I would say dilutive play, the only one that I feel or I realized that worked well, it was when there's an offering on something that's really hyped up or like very retail crowded. But the last offering I shorted was, um, I didn't play on uh, VKTX, but I shorted, I think... No, I don't. I think I did short. It was coin on that $1 billion offering. And I think I'm just missing some piece of the puzzle here. So they filed that they were going to be offering like a billion or, or more. And it was converted in 2030 and they're just taking on more debt. Normally, or from what I understand on small cap, when you see these type of, of play, or I would say on unprofitable company, it tends to really go down a lot, like like an instant 10%. And then the next day, sometimes we sell off another 15, 20%. And I was short at a pretty good price. It was, um, I think it was 254, um, 255, like before the, um, just a bit higher than this, where you have your mouth. Yeah, so mouth this is, there. It, it looks like it started at 256 um, and then the low is 242. Okay, so middle of that candle, so at a pretty good price, and I just I was quick. I had um I had it almost right in front of me, and I had like a filter for it. So as soon as it came, I just shorted it. But then I I just it just grinded all the way back up, and I was I was pretty frustrated. And how does these uh, offering really work, or how do you perceive them? Because how they work versus um reaction is always very different. You know, I think that the, the, you know, you, you made the key point, right? Um, like Coinbase, or even I thought you were going to say BKTX, which is, you know, a bio company with positive drug news. Um, but those are real companies that have real data, real news, right? Like 
versus the small cap rat stocks that most retail likes to short, right? Where they they pump it up so they can raise capital at a higher price, screw all the long-term bag holder, people that are looking for their rocket ships. Um, like, I think you just have to know the patterns, know the patterns and know the stocks, right? Like, you know the pattern, the, the patterns, the small cap ones, it really affects the small cap ones more so than a large cap name. Um, it doesn't mean that a large cap one can't give you a little scalp trade like this. Like, you know, it gave you 10 bucks, um, you know, but you obviously had a five to 10% move in your head kind of, kind of thought out, which is, you know, fine. You, you were game planning for something. Um, I think that, you know, the trader and you should see that it didn't, it made a new low and reversed. And that's where you should kind of like, uh Oh, like, you know, that's where the, the light should go off where it, it held this prior that held like this intraday low, basically, you know, this little intraday low in Bitcoin kind of sold off of uh 242. And once it can't break that new low, um, and it, it's like, Oh, well, you know, maybe I should cover some, um, just in case it, it does grind all the way back up. Right. Um, versus a small cap, like they need to raise money to keep their operations going usually. Right. Whereas Coinbase is probably just issuing it because they can, they have the demand for it and they're trying to expand into other things. I mean, they're probably trying to buy new servers because they keep crashing. Um, right. I, I, don't, I have no idea. I don't know. Right. Like, and then, you know, you, you have to play dumb to a certain extent just because the more, if you overthink, if you overthink it too much, you're just going to be analysis by paralysis and you're not going to be able to properly and clearly think through, you know, a trade. Right. Yeah. So I, I guess I really have to, when I'm looking at these offering, it doesn't matter if it's billions, if it's a really good company, it, it's not really bad. Yeah. It's going to have an initial move down, but I found more success on trading the one that actually holds lower prices and then a stay week the following day. I think this is really the one that had been, had been paying off um, just because it shows that it is really bad news for them and like bigger players are they don't like it. They don't enjoy it. They don't think it's a good um, position for them to take on more debts if they're probably not um, really generating profit. So how are they going to pay this except for just pushing their bankruptcy down the line? Um, so when it comes to to these type of trade, probably something I need to slow slow down and probably just cut out of my trading whatsoever, except if it's a it's a, it's a really a shit company. The next thing um, I wanted to bring up, if you didn't have any other charts to to go over. No, uh, yeah, I'm going to just make one more comment on that, um, just real quickly. Um, you know, Coinbase is some, one of the strongest names in, in, the, in, the, in the world right now, right? It's just super, it's very, very strong. Um, so any, any institutional investor who's looking to get long or doesn't have enough allocation, right? They're going to take those dips to as opportunities to buy versus like the small cap ones that usually have offerings they're you know it, it's it's more like they're down here they get it popped up have an offering and then they continue lower right i can't think of one off the top of my head that's done it so i can't bring up i don't want to bring up a name um but the chart's going to be closer to the bottom of the range versus the top of the range um and that's yeah that's i just wanted to mention that as another thought process yeah, uh, how the company is positioned um, in the overall market, um, like a company that's doing well, that's raising capital, it's probably positive versus a company that's raising capital because they're not doing well. It's it's very different, actually. I mean, yeah. just pretty simple, but very different. Exactly. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, when it comes to reviewing and not, not necessarily reviewing, but Looking at information outside the market or blogs or podcasts that you like to listen, is there any names that come to your mind that you think are, are pretty good for our viewers? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you know, as you know, through our conversations, I love to talk about the trading psychology side of things. Uh, I'm, I, uh, you know, I feel like for me, it's just, it's a con it's a constant battle, a constant battle with myself, you know, even with that SOUN trade, it's just, a, um, constantly going back and forth with myself, um, trying to adjust, trying to adjust my mentality, trying to make little tweaks where I can try to maximize my risk reward and, and, but still capture the trade. Um, 
you know, uh, you know, and, and no affiliations, but I love reading um, the blog posts by uh, Jared Tendler, um, Dr. Brett Steenbarger. Uh, he has a great blog as well. Um, and we can link those down below. Um, <clears throat> for viewers, I know a lot of, there's a lot of other traders that, that you know, quote those people and quote both of those, those people and link, link to them as well. Um, but they're both great reads. And, you know, Jared Chandler had a great one that I shared with you last night, um, which we can link that below. And just talking about FOMO. And I think that everyone experiences um, what he talks about in that blog, and it, it should really resonate with you. All right. Thanks. Um, I appreciate. Um, I know you have to go, but um, it was a good convo talking with you again, and hopefully we can catch up next week. Sounds good. Talk to you later. All right. Talk to you later. So thanks for watching the full episode. If you're still watching, I really appreciate. And also, while you're at it, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let us know in the comment section what you want to see next. Peace.